Hi, and welcome back to my videos for General Chemistry 2. Today we'll continue our discussion of different types of nuclear reaction. In the previous video, we talked about four types of nuclear reaction, alpha decay, beta decay, gamma decay, and positron emission. Each of these is a type of radioactivity, which means they each produce a different type of radiation. Whenever you see something that's radioactive, whether it's a rock containing uranium, a used fuel rod from a nuclear reactor, or the piece of americium in your smoke detector, the fact that it's radioactive means that it's undergoing one of these kinds of nuclear reaction. So there are lots of naturally occurring nuclear reactions like these. But there are also nuclear reactions that produce much more energy, and these are the ones that most people think of when they talk about nuclear reactions. The two most important kinds of nuclear reaction are called fission and fusion, and both kinds of reaction can be used in both nuclear weapons and nuclear reactors. Let's talk about fission first. In nuclear fission, a nucleus splits into two smaller nuclei. For example, suppose we have a curium-250 nucleus. It can undergo fission to produce a nucleus of palladium-46. What's the second product that we produce? As we saw in the previous video, we must balance the reaction by making the mass numbers and the atomic numbers equal on each side of the reaction. In this case, that means that the mass number of the second product must be 132, so that the total is 250 on both sides. Meanwhile, the atomic number must be 50. If we check the periodic table, we find out that the element with atomic number 50 is tin, so the second product is a tin-132 isotope. The important thing about fission reactions is that they're extremely exothermic. No ordinary chemical reaction could produce as much energy as a fission reaction like this one. For example, the fission reaction we just looked at has an enthalpy of negative 21.7 billion kilojoules per mole. That's over a million times higher than the next most energetic reaction we've ever looked at in this course. That's the reason these reactions are useful for generating power, or in weapons. In many fission reactions, when the reactant nucleus breaks apart, we get more than just the two smaller nuclei. Instead, many fission reactions also produce several neutrons. For example, the isotope californium-248 breaks up to produce a lead-208 nucleus, a sulfur-36 nucleus, and four neutrons. We use the symbol N for the neutrons, but how do we write the superscript and subscript? It turns out that neutrons and protons weigh nearly the same amount, about 1 AMU, so the mass number of a neutron is 1. For the atomic number, we need to think about the charge on a neutron. You might recall from the last video that we use negative 1 for the subscript of an electron because the charge on the electron is minus 1. For the same reason, the subscript on a neutron is 0 because neutrons have a charge of 0. If you look at the mass numbers on the right side of this reaction, you'll see that they are 208 for the lead isotope, 36 for the sulfur, and 1 for each of the four neutrons. That makes a total of 248 which is also what we had for the mass of the californium on the left side. That shows that this nuclear reaction is balanced. It turns out that the neutrons that are produced by a fission reaction are the key to making nuclear reactions useful. For example, one fission reaction begins with plutonium-244. In this reaction, the plutonium splits apart to form strontium-98, barium-140, and six neutrons. Now let's focus on those neutrons. They get ejected from the reaction at a high speed, and each of them might collide with another nearby plutonium-244 atom. That collision can cause those plutonium isotopes to undergo fission too, which means that each of them would release six neutrons of their own. Each of those could then cause their own fission reaction, and so on. But think about what that means. Suppose we start with just one plutonium atom undergoing fission. It produces six neutrons, and each of them starts another fission reaction. 
Each of those starts six more fission reactions. So now there are six times six reactions, which is 36. Each of those starts another six fission reactions for a total of 216. And that process continues. So after one step, there's six reactions. After two steps, there are 36, and so on. Those numbers climb really quickly. After just 25 steps, there would be 28 quintillion plutonium atoms reacting. Since each of the steps takes only a fraction of a second, this means that a huge number of reactions occurs in a very short amount of time, and each of them is highly exothermic, so it generates a huge amount of energy very quickly. Reactions like this, in which each reaction releases neutrons that cause several nearby atoms to react, it's called a chain reaction. Because so many fission reactions happen so quickly, the nuclear material becomes extremely hot very quickly. In a nuclear reactor, we can prevent the temperature from getting too hot too quickly by placing barriers, called control rods, between the uranium rods where the fission reactions begin. The control rods absorb the neutrons so they can't hit more uranium and start new reactions. In that way, we stop the chain reaction or at least limit it. Whenever we want the nuclear reactions to get hotter, we pull the control rods out a little, and whenever we want the reaction to slow down, we push the control rods back in. The chain reaction is also what makes a nuclear weapon so dangerous. In an atomic weapon, there are no control rods. Once the chain reaction starts, there's nothing to slow it down, so the chain reaction makes the nuclear fuel get so hot so quickly that it explodes, releasing a great deal of radiation and the products of the fission reaction. The isotopes that are the products of fission reactions are usually able to undergo nuclear reactions of their own, like alpha decay or beta decay. So in other words, the products of the fission reaction are themselves radioactive. That's why the products of fission reactions are often hazardous, and places where a nuclear explosion have happened can remain radioactive for many years. And that brings us to the last type of nuclear reaction I want to tell you about. In fission, we split a large nucleus into two smaller nuclei and usually some neutrons. As I said, the products can be radioactive, and so they're not very safe to keep around. It would be nice to have a reaction that made products that were much safer. Instead of fission, it's possible to combine two small nuclei into a larger one. That process is the opposite of fission, and it's called fusion. Like fission, nuclear fusion can release a large amount of energy. For example, an isotope of carbon-12 can combine in a fusion reaction with oxygen-16. In order to balance the reaction, we can see that the mass number will be 28 for the product, and the atomic number is 14. If we check the periodic table, we can see that the element with atomic number 14 is silicon, so that's what the product is. One important fusion reaction is this one, in which two hydrogen-2 isotopes fuse to form a helium-4 nucleus. This is one of the fusion reactions that occurs in the sun. Much of the heat and light of the sun comes from fusion reactions between hydrogen nuclei to form helium. This reaction is also especially interesting to engineers on Earth, because we'd very much like to use this reaction to provide energy in a nuclear reactor. If you think about it, you can see why. First, the product of this reaction is ordinary helium, which is much, much less toxic than the products of fission reactions that we use in nuclear reactors today. There's no radioactive waste product in this reaction, and also no neutrons formed in the reaction, so this reaction would be much more environmentally friendly. Also, since fusion reactions don't produce neutrons, that means they don't cause chain reactions, and that makes them much less likely to cause a dangerous runaway reaction. And best of all, the fuel is hydrogen-2, which is a naturally occurring isotope of hydrogen that itself is not radioactive. There could potentially be enough hydrogen-2 in a single liter of ordinary water to provide the fuel for a fusion reactor that could fuel a mid-sized city. So 
Why aren't we using nuclear fusion to power reactors? Unfortunately, it turns out it takes a lot of energy to get the fusion reaction to start. So we still need to work to make the technology cheaper and easier to use. This is an active area of research, though. Here's the view inside an experimental fusion reactor. You can see an engineer working on it near the back. When this reactor is turned on, here's a view of the fusion reaction happening in that room that we just saw. There's a very large fusion reactor like this one being constructed in southern France right now. The first experiments with it are scheduled to begin in 2025. Here's a drawing of what the reactor should look like when it's finished. As you can see, it's huge, about five stories high, with that donut-shaped reactor room in the center. Here's a picture of it under construction in 2018. You can see it still needs a lot of work before it'll be finished, but hopefully it'll be the first step toward using fusion reactions to produce energy that's safe and non-polluting. Anyway, to sum up, in the past two videos we've seen six types of nuclear reaction. Alpha decay, beta decay, positron emission, gamma decay, fission reactions, and fusion reactions. This list is roughly in the order of their increasing energy. Fusion reactions can produce the highest energies by far. We'll talk about fusion in more detail in a future video when we talk about stars and how they use fusion to produce heat and light. But there's enough new material for now. We'll talk more about radioactivity in the next video, so I hope you'll join me then. But until next time, have a good week!